It is in Matthew 24 and verse 14 that the Bible lets us know that Jesus gave the most profound statement on how we can see all things come to an end and ultimately usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. It says in Matthew 24 and verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. And when we think about the gospel, we should understand it more than simply a message that is to be preached. Because it is true that the gospel is a message to be preached in all the world for a witness. But the key is for a witness. And a witness is not something you simply hear. A witness is also something you see. As another way of looking at it, we can look at the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 16. And you will find that in the book of Romans, the first chapter and the 16th verse, that the Bible tells us exactly what the gospel is. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So there you have it. The gospel is not just simply lip service. The gospel is also power that is to be demonstrated throughout all the world. And the reason this is important is because power, once it is demonstrated, it will be witnessed. People will see the power of the gospel in an individual's life, and this will have a telling effect of the grace of God. It is because of this that now when we look at Revelation, the 14th chapter, if we consider the first of the three angels' messages, you will find that it tells us something very important in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says... And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. The Bible makes it clear that we are living in a judgment hour right now. God is doing a work of investigative judgment where he's making eternal decisions on who shall be with him forever and who will not. It is because of this solemn reality that we would do well because we're living in this time of judgment to follow the instructions of the Lord carefully. The Bible says that we are to fear God. We are to give glory to him. Now, to fear God, according to Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13, the Bible makes it clear to fear God is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. So therefore, in this first angel's message, there is a call to fear God, to hate what he hates, which can only come once we love what he loves. And as a result of this, if this is your experience, and if this is my experience, then we will be enabled to give glory to him. And we need to find out what does that mean practically? Because as we saw, the gospel is not something just to be preached. The gospel is also something to be witnessed. It is the power of God that is to be demonstrated before the eyes and the ears of humanity. So when we think about this, then the question is, what does it mean to glorify God? Because the angel says to fear God and give glory to him. Well, it is at this point now, we're gonna consider the book of Exodus, the 33rd chapter. It is in Exodus chapter 33 that the Bible helps us understand what does it mean to give glory to God. Now notice what the Bible says as we look at Exodus, the 33rd chapter, and we're going to consider verse 18. God and Moses are having a dialogue. They're talking one with another. And you find that in Exodus 33 and verse 18 that the Bible says in relation to Moses, it says in Exodus 33 and verse 18, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Moses wanted to see the glory of God. Moses was so connected, so much in communion with God that he made a very personal request. And friends can do that. You see, when we're friends with people, we can make personal requests. You can't do that with strangers, but you can do it with friends. God and Moses were friends. And Moses said, Lord, I beseech thee, let me see your glory. And God responds in verse 19 by saying, I will make all my goodness pass before thee and will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. God responds by saying, I'll show you my goodness and I'll proclaim my name. And therefore, what we find is that the glory of God, the goodness of God and the name of God are synonymous. They mean the same thing. 
Now, the reason this is important is because we're about to see God proclaim his name, which is also his goodness and glory in Exodus 34, 5 through 7. The Bible says in Exodus 34, 5 through 7, it says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity upon the, upon the fathers, upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Here it is that when God was proclaiming his name, making his goodness and his glory known, he revealed his character. So therefore, when we think about the glory of God, we are to understand that the glory of God is God's character. It is because of this that when again we look at that first angel's message, it says that we are to fear God, which is to hate what he hates and to love what he loves. And then it says, and give glory to him. Well, we understand what it means to give glory to him. It means that we are to reflect his character. Now, the question is, how do we do this? How practically can we reflect God's character living in this time of judgment? Well, the Bible gives us some clues. And what I'm going to do is show you one of many applications of this very passage of Scripture, fear God and give glory to him. What we're going to do is consider the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and I want you to see what it says here as we consider verse 19. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, and we're going to look at verse 19, and it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Then it says in verse 20, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Well, I want to focus on this discussion the body, glorifying God in our body. You see, one of the ways that we can give God glory in these times in earth's history is by how we take care of our bodies. The Bible says, glorify God in your body. And the way that it was here in 1 Corinthians 6 was that we would not defile ourselves in lewd practices like fornication, adultery. These were ways that we would glorify God in our body. We would refrain from participating with our bodies in anything that the word of God prohibits. But there's another application that we can make in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I want you to see this. It is in 1 Corinthians the 10th chapter that the apostle Paul was talking about the importance of soul winning. And he was talking about winning people to God and his truth. Well, it got to a point where Paul was talking about, listen, if people set food before you and you're wondering if it was food offered to an idol or not, he says, listen, if they don't say that it was, don't ask any questions. He says, go ahead and freely partake of it. Well, it got to a point that he says, but if they tell you, well, this was food offered to an idol, then go ahead and refuse it respectfully and let them know that you could not partake of it. And then he concludes in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 by saying, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Well, here it is that one of the ways we can give glory to God is by our choices in eating and drinking. One of the ways that we can give glory to God is by what we decide to put within our bodies that we are to glorify him. And I want to add another application to what we just read in 1 Corinthians 10. You see, whatever you and I eat or drink, it should enable us to better glorify God, which is to reflect his character. So that means then that whatever I eat and whatever I drink actually can affect my character. And the reason this is important is because very few people believe that their eating and their drinking habits do not affect their character development and their spirituality, even their salvation. Is this true? Let us find out from the Bible. You see, if you were to ask someone today, or if I was to ask you, do you think that what I eat and what I drink affects the development of my character, therefore the development of my spirituality, and could even affect my salvation? If somebody were to ask you that question, what would your answer be? 
Well, in the majority of Christianity today, people would say, no, it doesn't have any bearing upon my character. It doesn't have any bearing upon my salvation. But the question is, is this true? And I believe the scripture has the answer. Let's use an example. In Isaiah, the 59th chapter, the Bible says something very important in Isaiah 59 and verse 2. And I want us to go ahead and read that together because you're going to see that in Isaiah 59, there is something that can affect our characters and even our salvation. And I want you to see what the Bible calls it. In Isaiah 59 and verse 2, it says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And it says, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Well, notice that the Bible is very clear that there is something that is called iniquity and iniquity can separate us from God. Now, I don't think anyone intelligently, at least, would admit that iniquity has no bearing on our salvation. Clearly, iniquity does affect our salvation because it says it separates us from God. And no man wants to be separated from the Lord, at least no one who knows truly who the Lord is. Well, if iniquity or since iniquity separates us from God, therefore affects our salvation, again, does my eating and drinking habits affect my salvation? Well, let's consider the book of Ezekiel chapter 16. It is in Ezekiel the 16th chapter that the Bible helps answer this question. And it uses a time, a place, if you will, talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. And it talks about the effects of Sodom and Gomorrah, of which we know in Genesis 19, they were destroyed by fire and brimstone. Well, here it is that the Bible says something very important about why. In Ezekiel 16 and verse 49, the Bible says, behold, this was the iniquity. Now, wait a minute. What did we learn about iniquity? We learned that iniquity is something that separates us from God and therefore affects our salvation. Well, notice what the Bible says. It says, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. So whatever these iniquities were, the Bible says these are things that separates man from God. Well, notice it says this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride. In other words, pride can separate us from God. The Bible calls it iniquity. But not only that, it also says fullness of bread. Well, wait a minute. What is that? What does it mean when it says fullness of bread? Fullness of bread, another term for that would be gluttony. In the Bible, you often hear the word gluttony, and gluttony is the overconsumption of food. It's an eating habit. And therefore, the Bible lists as iniquity, and remember the definition of iniquity, it is something that separates us from God. It affects our salvation. Here it is that the Bible is showing us that iniquity is actually something that separates us from God and can be manifested through pride, a proud individual, an individual with a proud heart. It says this can separate them from God. But not only that, also the overindulgence of appetite, overeating, gluttony. The Bible calls this also iniquity. And therefore, we can say under the authority of the word of God that overindulging in appetite, overeating, practicing gluttony in the eyes of God is iniquity. And what does iniquity do? It separates us from God. It affects our salvation. So when an individual says, does my eating and drinking habits affect my salvation? The answer is yes, it can. Now, this is eating, but what about drinking? Well, let's consider the book of Proverbs, the 20th chapter. You see, it is in Proverbs, the 20th chapter, that the Bible talks about things that individuals can drink, and it talks about what it has as an effect on them. It says in Proverbs 20 and verse 1, it says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is, raising, is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Well, if you were to carefully study the book of Daniel, chapter 12, you will find that it is only the wise that inherit salvation. It is only the wise that are going to go home with Jesus. But here it is that the Bible says wine, however, alcohol, it is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And when we drink it, we're deceived and we are not wise. 
So therefore, again, the Bible makes it clear that whether we're drinking or eating of things that the word of God prohibits us to partake of, if we choose to do it deliberately after receiving this instruction, the Bible calls it iniquity. It calls it sin. It calls it deception. And we are not wise. And therefore, we will not inherit that which only belongs to the wise, which is salvation. So the Bible is clear that we are to do well to remember the great teachings of Jesus. Jesus said in this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. And the gospel is not just to be preached, but is to be witnessed. And we learned that the gospel is none other than God's power that is given unto us to demonstrate before humanity. And therefore, when John the Revelator saw an everlasting gospel that was being preached to every nation, kindred, tongue and people, this gospel was not just being preached, but also demonstrated in the first angel's message. It was a call to fear God and give glory to him. And we learned to give glory to God is to reflect his character. And we also learn that a way that we can reflect God's character is in our bodies by how we eat and drink. And the question is, what is it that affects my mind, that can affect my spirituality? And we learn that even our eating and our drinking habits can have a direct effect upon our spirituality, even upon our salvation. And my hope and my prayer is that when we study the Bible, that we will carefully look at God's instructions on how and what we are called to eat and drink that we may give glory to him. I've made my decision. The question is, have you? God bless you.